Welcome everyone and thanks for joining this focus session for MS365Con 2021Q2 hosted by Hornet Security. Hornet Security is a leading email cloud security and backup provider which protects the IT infrastructure, digital communication and data of companies and organizations of all sizes. As a security specialist, Hornet Security provides its services worldwide via nine redundant secure data centers. Its product portfolio cover all important areas of email security, including spam and virus filters, legally compliant archiving and encryption, defense against CEO fraud and protection against ransomware, as well as backup and recovery. With more than 300 employees, Hornet Security operates in more than 30 countries through its international channel partner network. Its premium services are used by approximately 40,000 customers, including Swisscom, Telefonica, Konica, Minolta, LVM, and Decra. I have a few quick housekeeping items before I introduce our speaker. We encourage you to use the questions panel as always to submit any questions or comments you have during the presentation. We'll try to address as many of those as we can. Any that we're not able to get to will be shared with our speaker uh, for follow up with you after the conference via email. Our speaker for this session is Andy Surwich. Andy is a 20 year IT pro specializing in infrastructure, cloud and Microsoft 365 suite. He also holds the Microsoft MVP award in cloud and data center management. And Andy is one of the few is also a VMware V expert. And with that, Andy, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, much appreciated, Roger, thank you. And hey everyone, uh, good to be here, happy to uh be here presenting a session to you today. Uh, one other thing I want to mention on my bio here really quick is uh, if you have any follow-up questions, um, you know, maybe you think of after the fact or, hey, you just want to connect, um, you can reach out to me on Twitter uh, always at, at Acer, which is my handle there. Um, sorry, you'll have to spell the last name, but uh, you can always reach out to me there if needed. Um, so yeah, Roger kind of mentioned uh, Hornet Security, the, uh, the sponsor of this session today, uh, a little bit already. Um, mentioned the data centers and we've you got got a basically a global presence with offices in Europe and uh, Latin America and and the U.S. And again, you know, we're leading uh, email security providers for uh, cloud technologies, and our focus is to protect you so that you can focus on what you do, right? So just a little a little bit more about the uh, the the organization. So organization really got its start back in you know the 2007 2008 ish time frame. Um, it started with things like archiving and email encryption and then got into advanced threat protection, the 365 space, uh, 365 total protection or total encryption, um, and you know has been recently been making a lot of strategic acquisitions to really kind of fill out that product portfolio, um, and that allows us to provide more services, more holistic security, again to protect you, so your organizations can do what it is you do, right? So with that, let's actually sit down and start talking about what your here to learn about today. And that is, uh, what email security basics are you getting inboxed with Microsoft 365? And ultimately, we're gonna get to the question of, are those services, are those features enough for your organization? That's really what the crux of this session is, and that's what we're gonna be covering. So when we talk about what email security basics you get inbox with Microsoft 365, we will online. Exchange online protection is kind of the baseline, you know, spam, malware, content, and policy filtering engine for Microsoft 365 and Exchange on-prem. Um, it's more often uh, associated with Exchange Online um, because every single Microsoft 365 license that you, you choose comes with EOP. It just comes with it. Um, so even if you're using Exchange Online Plan 1, which I think is like the very basic, the, the absolute lowest level of Exchange Online that you can get, um, any mail that's flowing through that mailbox is getting scanned with Exchange Online protection. Um, you know, I mentioned it's most often associated with, uh, with Microsoft 365. But uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, you can use this with Exchange on-premises. Um, obviously, there's some M MX records that need to be updated and changed. There's a little bit of, of footwork that needs to be done to get uh, EOP put in place, but it is doable. And, you know, regardless of whether you're using it for uh, on-premises Exchange or Exchange Online, uh, EOP, they, you know, you'll see this in all their documentation that it provides a 99% spam detection rate. And whether or not that's good enough for your organization, uh, like I said, we're gonna get into that here in the next couple of slides. 
Um, before I move on to the next slide, though, I really want to kind of highlight how EOP works at a high level. So on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see uh, from docs.microsoft.com, this is kind of the logical layout of, uh, of EOP. So you get your, your internet at the top, and as email gets routed into the, into, uh, the service, there are a number of different filters um, that are used for, for filtering the mail content. So you've got your connection filtering, which will do things like um, look at the IP address that the piece of email is coming from and compare that with blacklists and uh, you know known IP addresses that are uh, known to send spam. It'll do that type of uh, investigation and, and searching. And then it gets to the anti-malware portion where, you know, obviously it's looking for, for malware within, the, uh, within the, the email object. And then it gets to policy filtering. And these are policies that you as the uh, Exchange Online or <laughs> the, the, the administrator of EOP, these would be like custom policies that you set up inside of the, uh, inside of the tool to control uh, mail filtering within your Exchange organization. And then it gets to the content filtering at the end. And, and at any stage of this, uh, the tool is um, it's grading and anal you know analyzing the piece of email and uh, you know if it picks something up it's going to send it into quarantine or junk um, that could be uh, the admin quarantine or the end user quarantine um, or you know if everything's hunky dory it will end up in the recipient mailbox um, so uh, that's kind of how Exchange Online Protection works at a high level. Um, but, you know, on top of the, the filtering stuff, there are some other basic uh, notable features. So this is by no means a comprehensive list. If you look at the list of features for uh, Exchange Online Protection out on Microsoft's website, the list is much longer than this. But the one thing I noticed when I was looking through that list, I mean, they'll they'll list like the tiniest little feature as a, a feature, right? Um, and one of the things that that kind of uh, that kind of fits that bill that I included in this list here is quarantine. I mean, you, you kind of assume with any anti-spam service or an anti um, you know any email security service, it's just kind of assumed that you're going to get some sort of quarantine from the service, right? But Microsoft goes out of their way to to list that as an option. Um, I included it here just because um, you know it is a notable feature. It is something that uh, not only administrators and users have come to rely on day in and day out. Um, so it's worth mentioning. It's also worth mentioning here that um, Exchange Online Protection also provides what's called the administrator uh, quarantine as well that allows uh, administrators to take a look at quarantine pieces of email uh, additionally. Uh, a couple of the other items on this page, so we got data loss prevention. So EOP has um, some data loss prevention capabilities that tie in with the other DLP um, features inside of the M365 suite. Uh, if you're not familiar what, with what uh, DLP is, um, data loss prevention basically uh, helps you, the administrator, prevent sensitive data from leaving the organization. So um, things like, oh, hey, this piece of email has uh, a social security number in it uh, and prevent that from leaving the organization. Things like that is kind of what DLP gets into. And you also have message encryption that you can do um, via an issued PKI certificate. Um, and message encryption is great. Um, it's a fantastic feature. The problem with it um, as implemented in uh, Exchange Online Protection is that you, the administrator, you have to deploy and manage the certificates to the end users that are going to be using message encryption. Um, it's not insurmountable by any means, but it is an additional administrative task that you have to put on your workstation deployment list, your user maintenance list, it's another task that you have to worry about and keep track of when you're going about your day-to-day -day business. Uh, and the other item on the list that we haven't covered yet here is audit logging. So this is just kind of the standard audit logging that is present in the M365 platform today. Uh, when we talk about this through the scope of email, this would be things like, hey, I wanna see if you know uh, Bob in accounting deleted this piece of email you know, last Tuesday. Um, you know, that's kind of what the audit logging capabilities are used for uh, in Exchange Online Protection. So that's kind of Exchange Online Protection in a nutshell. Um, you know, the next question that always comes up is how is it licensed? And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Exchange Online Protection is really included with all M365 plans. So if you, like I said, even if you have the, the baseline Exchange Online Plan 1, you just have a mailbox, you have EOP today. 
Um, when it comes to purchasing, you only really have to purchase it separately for on-premises exchange. And um, it's $1 per user per month, basically, is what it comes down to, with an annual commitment there. And that's kind of, to me, <laughs> there should be a big asterisk around the annual commitment, right? So, so I mean, if I have a 1,000 users that I want to use this for with my on-premise exchange server, that's a thousand user, a thousand dollars a month times twelve. So that's twelve thousand dollars. And if I change my mind halfway through the year, right? Um, I either have to be okay with basically losing six thousand dollars of value, or you know, I have to wait six months to switch to a different product, right? That's the only problem I see with a uh, an annual commitment like that. So let's get to the question now: of is it enough? And and there's you know speaking of asterisks there's <laughs> there should be an asterisk around this question as well because you know when people ask me the question they say hey Andy you know is um you know th this is my this is my business this is what we do is Exchange Online protection enough for what I need and my answer always starts like so many things in IT so many questions in IT is well it depends <laughs> right it really depends ultimately on your organization, on your compliance, your requirements, um, and things like that. So, you know, when it comes to very <clears throat> business focused criteria like that, um, I try to leave that out as much as I can in these types of presentations because, um, you know, I try to present this from the standpoint of stuff that people can actually wrap their heads around and definitively say one way or the other. Um, but again, a lot of this stuff is going to depend on your particular organization needs and whether or not you have compliance requirements like uh, ITAR or HIPAA or GDPR or, you know, any of the other half dozen or other uh, <laughs> compliance uh, requirements out there in the world today. So the first thing I want to start with here is let's start by looking at that 99% spam detection rate that Microsoft um, states for Exchange Online Protection. And, and don't get me wrong, 99% is not anything to sneeze at. 99% is still 99%, right? Um, that's a lot. But it's not as good as 99.9%. It's kind of like, you know, that uptime percentage for cloud services, right? You know, the three nines or the four nines. It's kind of the same thing here. And a lot of people wonder, like, okay, well, why does Microsoft only provide, you know, 99% for spam detection? Can't they do better than that? And I, you know, the, the thing I always bring up when I get to this partic particular section of the, uh, the conversation is, let's go back and think about Internet Explorer for a second. <laughs> you know, I, uh, that great web browser back from the, uh, the late 90s and early 2000s, right? I mean, back then, Internet Explorer was the web browser, right? You know, it had vastly way more uh, us you know, users in the world than any other browser at the point, uh, that point in time. And, you know, you had other browsers starting to come up like Firefox. And I think uh, Chrome had recently, the point in time I'm thinking of Chrome had just come out. And you saw Firefox and Chrome making a ton of innovative features inside of their browser. And a lot of people wondered, what, like, why did Microsoft sit there with Internet Explorer and not, not do anything? Well, you know, Microsoft kind of had a responsibility, being as they had the browser with the most market share, it was kind of their responsibility to not break the internet, right? When you've got millions of users using your web browser to basically get to sensitive data and, and do their work on a day-to-day -day basis, it was kind of their job to not break the internet by implementing a change that might accidentally break stuff. And that kind of prevented them from being maybe as aggressive as they wanted to be. That also applies to Exchange Online Protection and M365 as a whole. You think about the number of users that are on the Microsoft 365 platform um, <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis, and they kind of have a responsibility to make sure that they're not overly aggressive in their spam filtering to where, you know, all of a sudden, 10% uh, of an organization's legitimate email messages are getting flagged as spam, and they're not getting to where they need to go. So they kind of have a responsibility to uh, to their their customers in that regard, just because of the vast scale of their services. Now, again, like I said, ninety nine percent is nothing to sneeze at, but when we look at it at scale, it does start to become a little bit of a problem. So you know, I use nice round numbers for this particular example, um, 
But as you can see here on the left-hand side of the screen, we've got, in this example, a million spam mails. I'll say a million spam mails are coming into the organization. We start with a 99% spam detection rate at the top line here. So 99% spam detection rate would allow 10,000 of those emails to get through. And then let's say on average, you know, a user sifting through Outlook, they come across the message that's spam. They're probably going to sit there for about a minute and say, huh, I don't know who this is from, or, hey, this looks a little sketchy, or, oh, it's spam, and then they delete it. Right? Let's say that they take roughly a minute. Now, that's 10,000 minutes of lost productivity time, which equates to roughly 167 hours. Now, you know, if, if you've been an administrator for any point of time, you know that one minute on average is probably on the low end because there's always you always have those users that uh, oh crap I don't know what this is I better call IT you know so they pick up the phone they call IT and they say hey I've got this really weird email and now it's taken longer than a minute and now they're involving someone from IT a support ticket has been opened somebody's taking a look at it you know you think about all the time that gets sunk in into that and involved with that um, and and again that's just the time portion of it. You know, if we look at the uh, the 99.9 percent .9 spam detection uh, rate on the bottom, only a thousand spam emails get through, which basically is a delta of 9,000 minutes between the two. Um, the bottom option, you're really only losing about uh, just a little bit more than 16 and a half hours of time. And again, this is looking at it strictly from a lost time and product uh, productivity standpoint. You know, you know, out of those 10,000 there's probably going to be at least one or two users that they click on a link in one of those messages or, you know, their machine gets ransomware because of it, or there's going to be one or two that get through. And now you're looking at probably hours and hours and hours of damage control for that one specific issue. So again, when we talk about, you know, at scale, 99.99% 99 spam detection um, is not, anywhere near as good as 99.9% .9 spam detection. A lot of nines in there. <laughs> anyway, so moving on to the next slide here, you know, a couple of reasons to, to continue looking further. So Exchange Online Protection Detection Guarantee does not apply to non-English emails. This kind of comes as a surprise to everyone. And they're like, really, Andy, that's, that's a thing? That is, in fact, a thing. So if you go ahead and look at the SLAs, for Exchange Online and the M365 services, you'll see that the spam effectiveness service level does not apply to email containing a majority of non-English content. So if you're interested in, in taking a look at this document yourself, I included a bit.ly link at the bottom. I, I don't normally like to use bit.ly links in presentations like this, but the actual URL was really long and ugly, and I just want you to be able to quickly get to it um, as opposed to having to to jot down this huge URL. So if you want to read this document, um, the URL is down there in the bottom left corner of the screen. But, you know, this this may not apply to all, all organizations, but if you're an organization that is multilingual, maybe you've got organization, you know, you've got, you know, staff all over the world, chances are that you are a multilingual organization and you may have a large subset of your user base that is going to be susceptible to spam that contains non-English content. The Exchange Online Protection SLAs don't apply to non-English content when it's filtering out spam. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing that's uh, worth keeping in mind is that Microsoft SLAs exclude zero-day threats in terms of Exchange on Online Protection. And they don't outright say that, but if you kind of read between the lines here, and this is from the same SLA document, read between the lines here, um, in order for you to get that service credit for, you know, a broken SLA, a virus has to be considered as known. So what do they consider as a known virus? A virus is considered known when widely used commercial virus scanning engines can detect the virus and the detection capability is available throughout the EOP network. So again, they don't actually come out here and actually say that zero day threats are excluded, but you read between the lines and a virus has to be known by widely used commercial virus scanning engines um, in order for that SLA guarantee to basically take effect. And the other thing that's worth noting here is if you look at the bottom line, 
I have it highlighted in red at the very bottom with a maximum of one claim allowed per calendar month. Now, Microsoft talks about their money back SLAs all the time, which don't get me wrong, it's fantastic, right? You look at uh, some of the other cloud vendors in the world and um, you know they don't have money back SLAs, whereas Microsoft does, but you have to fight tooth and nail to g actually get money out of these money back SLAs. There's a lot of loopholes that you have to deal with and this is another one that just kind of stood out to me when I was uh, putting this presentation together was, you know, if you have two incidents per month or three incidents per month, God forbid, you're still, you're only allowed one claim for that calendar month when it comes to SLAs. So um, another thing to be aware of. And on top of that, you know, when I was looking through this SLA list, you know, BSI did a report back in 2019 that basically stated 320K new malware programs a day, a day, <laughs> a day. You know, I had to go and double check this because I'm like, that seems like a lot. But, you know, multiple locations on the net that I looked for, um, you know, they had maybe a slightly different number, but it was a lot more than you think. So, you know, the question comes down to, how safe do you think your organization really is from zero day threats? Um, and you know, a good example of that would be the recent, uh, the recent rash of exchange, you know, the on-premise exchange um, zero day threats. There's been a lot of those recently. So while they're rare, they do happen. And uh, when they do happen, you wanna know that you've got a um, email security in place that will help deal with those. So with that, where do you go from here? And that's always the question after you've kind of looked at it. And again, we're trying to answer that question is, is the basics that are included in box with M365, uh, are those email security basics enough? And um, where do you go from here? So kind of the logical place that people go is what was at one time known as uh, Microsoft uh, ATP. Um, advanced threat protection. It has now been rebranded, I think, since uh, September of last year as Microsoft Defender for Microsoft 3, or <laughs> well, I got that wrong. It's my, it's, technically, it's Microsoft Defender for Office 365. <laughs> I, I'm so used to putting Microsoft 365 because um, as a brand, Office 365 is supposed to be going away and, and switching to Microsoft 365. That's, that's not confusing at all. Uh, but anyway, um, technically the, the new branded product is called Microsoft Defender for Office 365. Anyway, uh, what is Microsoft Defender for Office 365? It's basically a collection of additional security tools for your 365 tenants. And um, the licensing requirements are, are interesting. Um, so I spent a lot of time digging through licensing documents and um, purchasing guides and all of that type of stuff, trying to, def to figure out and determine all the different ways that you could, you could procure Microsoft Defender for Office 365. And you automatically get Defender for Office 365 as you know, part of any of these particular SKUs. So um, typically it's, it's relegated strictly to the E5 level offering in M365, which, you know, if, if you've worked with M365 for any length of time, you know that E5 is like, you know, the Rolls Royce. That's like the Ferrari of Microsoft 365 licensing. Um, it also is works for the A5 SKU, which is the, the educational line um, of the Microsoft licensing is significantly cheaper uh, on the education side, but you do have to be an educational organization um, that qualifies for that. Um, it's also part of Windows 10 Enterprise E5, uh, the EMS E5 suite, um, or any of the other uh, bundles that are included there below. Now, as so often, um, Microsoft also includes it, includes it as an add-on, um, and you can get it as a add-on as well, but, I had to dig and dig and dig and dig through documents and UIs to actually find where it was available as an add-on. Um, Microsoft does such a good job of pushing you towards the bundles, towards E3, E5, you know, that it's really hard to find those add-ons sometimes. And I mean, <laughs> when we're talking about anything, um, Microsoft 365 licensing, you get all these different licensing SKUs, all these different bundles, all these different add-ons. Um, and, oh, hey, this add-on works here, but it doesn't work over here. And, 
it, it kind of works here, but it doesn't work there. And oh, hey, that's a, a government only skew. And oh, hey, that's an uh, a, a educational only skew. I feel like sometimes when you're trying to kind of uh, decipher M365 licensing, I, I kind of feel like this, you know? <laughs> Administrators are trying to de decipher Microsoft 365 licensing. It's like, you know, trying to do really hard math, right? It's never really easy. And, you know, we talk about how Microsoft continuously pushes people towards those bundles. You know, most people, if they want Microsoft Defender for Office 365, just to keep things simple, they may just go with the E5 SKU, which is $57 per user per month. Now that's MSRP. You know, if you go through partner, you may be able to negotiate a little bit better of a deal, but I don't know too many partners that are willing to go much under MSRP. Um, I guess if you're a huge organization and you've got volume on your side, you may be able to neg negotiate a few bucks off that. But um, again, generally it's, it's $57 per user per month. Now that gets you a lot more than just advanced security features for M365. There's, there's a lot of other stuff that's included in that. But if that's what you're setting out to achieve for your organization, for simplicity's sake, that's probably where you're going to end up. And that's where Microsoft wants you to end up too. So with all that in mind, with Exchange Online Protection and knowing kind of what the Microsoft native upgrade path looks like, what does it look like for additional protection? You know, we did kind of a survey of users and 52% of people think that Microsoft 365 is safe enough. So barely more than half. 32% um, of them think that additional protection costs too much, which, you know, based on the conversation we just had, um, obviously you can see that, uh, you know, those E5 features can be very expensive. And then 29% want additional protection, but haven't prioritized it yet. And, the, you know, when I think about the, the fact that they haven't prioritized it yet, I, I, I ask myself why. Um, and typically the answer is level of effort, right? Uh, it seems too hard or we've got too much going on or maybe we don't want to, to implement a major change at this point in time. Usually it's, it's one of those reasons. And, you know, that kind of brings me to third party options. Why is a third party option better, right? And that, that's where the conversation starts to turn is where do you go elsewhere for email security features um, for M365? Now, uh, like I said, uh, Microsoft Defender for Office 365 is kind of a logical place to look first. But I always look at that from the perspective, especially when we're talking about security. You know, if, if you're using uh, Microsoft Defender for Office 365, it's kind of like the situation where you've got a factory owner but the factory owner is also the compliance inspector for the factory, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's like you're in a situation where where Microsoft, you're using their platform for productivity, collaboration, and innovation. You, you know, when that becomes so integral to your business, do you want them to be the only ones that has eyes basically on the core tools for your organization, right? And the, the next bullet point here, you know, not limited to what you can protect based on M365 licensing levels. And, and it kind of ties in with the third bullet point, less complex licensing. It's less complex licensing when you go with a third party. You know, I just talked about how complex Microsoft 365 licensing can be. You know, you almost need a PhD to be able to get through Microsoft 365 licensing. And at the end of the day, you've got an objective to achieve for your organization. Um, and you just want that to be as easy as possible as easy to quantify as possible, um, as easy to explain to the bean counters and upper management as possible. And, um, you know, the licensing in the M365 suite can make that difficult sometimes. You know, multi-tenant situations is another place where third-party options in the email security arena go a long way. Um, you think about multi-tenant management in M365, it can be a real pain in the rear end sometimes. So maybe you're a, a private organization and you've got multiple Office 365 tenants for whatever reason. I think the most common reason I've run into over the years is uh, acquisitions. So maybe you've acquired a company or a number of companies and you've got their M365 organization that you're either in the process of integrating into your main one, or maybe you have to maintain it and manage it outside of your main, your, your main tenancy. There's a lot of reasons why you may have multi-tenants. The other situation where you might be in a situation of multi-tenant management is maybe you're a service provider. Service providers have to manage M365 services across hundreds of customers, right? 
And if you think about managing, you know, any M365 service across multiple tenants, you know, it, it, things like uh, Lighthouse and, and some other features that Microsoft has been working on are kind of helping with that multi-tenant management, but it's far from perfect still. You know, if I want to make changes to this user's tenant, I have to log into it as an administrative user. I need to make my changes. I have to do whatever troubleshooting I'm, I'm working on. And then, oh, okay, this other customer is having issues. Now I have to log out of this tenant, log into theirs. Meanwhile, I'm having to, to manage that, that entire authentication mechanism between the partners and, um, you know, the partner of record and the end customer. And it's, it, it can be really hard to keep your arms wrapped around that, especially as a service provider. So that's where a third party option really, uh, really creates some, some uh, efficiencies there. You know, it provides some separation for M365 for critical security needs. I kind of talked to this a, a little bit already. You don't want to be in a situation where, like I said, the factory owner is also the compliance inspector. Um, so that separation, I feel, is very important, especially when it comes to security. And then you're going to get a higher quality support, typically. I say typically <laughs> because it doesn't apply in all cases. But in most cases, you're going to get a higher quality support than you would get from Microsoft support, which... Personally, in my own experience working in IT for 20 years, um, my, my support experience with Microsoft has been pretty hit or miss over the years. Sometimes I get a really good technician. More often than not, it's, it's like pulling teeth, right? So again, kind of coming back to that question is, is the inbox tools enough? The question that we're trying to answer in this session today. And you know, maybe you've kind of already made the decision that, okay, maybe they're not enough or yeah, I'm feeling okay with them right now. Whatever the, the question is, if there was a way to kind of determine, to kind of help you make that decision, would you, would you take it? And that's kind of where this tool I want to talk about comes into play a little bit. So we've got a, a new tool that's currently in beta called Threat Monitor. Um, so Hornet Security Threat Monitor. And basically what it does is it is a free tool, again, like I said, in beta that Hornet Security has developed that essentially allows you to test the permeability of Exchange Online Protection. Basically what the, the tool does is it's an OAuth application, so you have to authenticate with it to your Office 365 organization. We kind of set up a journaling rule in the back end that allows us to scan your incoming emails and essentially show you which pieces of spam and other threats make it through Exchange Online Protection and end up in your end user mailboxes. So essentially this tool allows you to see and kind of answer that question, is Exchange Online Protection enough? This will show you what's making it through Exchange Online Protection. So like I mentioned, in addition to spam and virus mails, you know, you'll also see things that are identified as, as advanced threats. Uh, no MX record changes required here, which is, again, if I'm putting my system administrator hat back on, is huge. Um, no MX records are required for this particular service. And you also have the option of manually deleting the detected spam messages right from user mailboxes, right from the mobile app. If I'm the administrator and, oh, oh crap, the, the CEO got a bunch of spam messages, I don't want them accidentally clicking something inside of those messages you can actually remove them from his mailbox or her mailbox right from the right from the app. So yeah, the the app is a mobile app. So, you know, one thing I noted here is these are beta images and are subject to change, but the app is designed to run on iOS and Android and you know you you launch the app, you sign up for the service, you go through a couple of uh, like I mentioned authentication mechanisms in order to uh, provide the app access to Office 365. And then you get into the app and you have these different views. So as I mentioned, you've got the um, the delete email option. So if uh, you want to, you can manually delete pieces of spam messages that are actively sitting in users' mailboxes. And you've got the ability to view the different types of threat statistics that are making it through the Exchange Online Protection filter. So as you can see in that second image from the left-hand side of the screen, you know, 42% are key loggers. 33% uh, 3, are remote access Trojans. You've got some miners and then you've got attack vectors, you know, attachment downloaders, droppers, <laughs> fraud, phishing. Um, it gives you all kinds of different information on the types of threats that are coming into your organization. Uh, you've also got some uh, email statistics. So, you know, what percentage of the threats are spam? Or them, which of them are threats? Um, advanced threats would be things like um, CEO fraud attempts and things like that. Uh, and then you've got the alert view on the far right hand side where you can see the different uh, pieces of spam or threats uh, and what uh, users they are associated with. 
So again, that's uh, that's the mobile app. It's currently in beta, and you can uh, once that becomes available, you can get more information on that out on the Hornet Security website at hornetsecurity.com. There is some paid options for 365 uh, protection uh, on the Hornet Security side of the house. Um, so we've got 365 Total Protection Business and 365 Total Protection Enterprise. So you get a number of security features for Office 365. Uh, with both of these uh, these SKUs. On the enterprise side, you get uh, some additional features like ATP sandboxing, forensic analysis, global security dashboard, URL malware control. There's a lot of different stuff on there. Again, the full list of features and their comparisons are available uh, on the Hornet Security website, again, at hornetsecurity.com. And uh, Horn Security also provides a number of different uh, services and products, um, even outside of Office 365. So we've got Advanced Threat Protection, which is designed for on-premises uh, mail server installations, uh, offer spam and malware protection, email encryption, continuity services, archive signature and disclaimers. And if you're looking for a fully secured end-to-end -end email service, um, Horn Security offers that as well. Now, uh, just before we wrap up today, I kind of want to leave you with a couple of additional resources here. I've kind of already mentioned the Hornet Security website a few times, again, hornetsecurity.com. And uh, I mentioned that 365 Total Protection product, uh, the URL for that specifically is the second line item there. Uh, Hornet Security also has a fantastic blog, uh, which is basically your location for IT security news, which you can get there from the third URL. And then uh, Altera Software, which is part of the Hornet Security Group, um, you can get Microsoft 365 and other Microsoft-centric contents and MSP and VMware content as well um, at altero.com slash dojo. Um, a lot of great content out there. So with that, I, th I just wanted to open up the floor for questions. Roger, I don't know if we've had any questions come in, but uh, you've probably had your eye on them if we had. Thanks, Andy. Yes, we do have some questions that I will jump right into. Okay, the first one is... Is there a baseline level of email protection I need to have in place for compliance requirements? Yeah, it kind of goes back to, I think I, I mentioned that a little bit in one of the very first slides and it, it's a good question. And I, as much as it pains me to say, the answer is always, it depends. Um, it really depends on the compliance, you know, the regulatory compliance that you have to adhere to. Is it, you know, I, is it is it ITAR and CMMC? Are you do you have to be certified for Department of Defense workloads uh, here in the U.S.? That's a very very strict uh, compliance regulation. So the requirements for that are different than they are for uh, PCI or or HIPAA, right? So it really depends on the particular compliance regulation you have to worry about. Um, what I would suggest is sitting down with your compliance officer or you know, maybe you're a small business and you don't have a compliance officer. Um, you know, at that point, I would suggest you consult uh, your legal professional to figure out exactly which pieces do you need to worry about. And then what you can do then is start lining up those requirements with different products, such as, you know, 365 Total Protection to see whether or not they fill those gaps in your, your compliance needs. Very good. Next question is, I agree that Microsoft 365 licensing is complex, but don't I just have to figure out licensing once if I have to consider additional licenses? I, I wish I wish that was the case. Don't don't get me wrong. I, I wish that's how it was. <laughs> I you know, I've worked with uh, with Office 365 for a long time and I don't think I've seen a single organization where the licensing requirements or the the licensing, I, I've never seen a single organization where the license requirements didn't change you know, multiple times a year. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is organizations needs change. So, oh, hey, where uh, uh, an E3 subscription was enough before, now you need E5. Or um, this particular user used to be able to get by with just Exchange Online Plan 1, but now they need, you know, these other apps and features over here. So now we have to change them to this license. Or uh, Microsoft does away with a specific SKU and you have to switch to something else. And there's just so many variables and different things that uh, require changes on the M365 licensing side that it's, uh, I, I just, after a while, uh, when I was still in the trenches doing IT work, I just got to the point to where I just came to expect change when it came to M365. So 
as much as I'd like to believe that you, <laughs> that you could figure it out once, that's uh, in my experience, that's just not the case, unfortunately. <laughs> my apologies. Okay, we do have one other question. It is with regards to the free threat monitor, is it easily removed once you're done with it? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, if you, you turn it out and you just, you know, hey, uh, I, I want to remove it, or maybe you want to, you know, maybe you have to reinstall it for some reason or, or whatever, it, it is it is fairly easy to uh, to remove. It's like I said, it's just a kind of a journaling rule under the hood. You'll remove that and you'll remove the um, the rights uh, that the, the app has to your Office 365 tenant. And yeah, that's it. Beings, we don't require any uh, major, you know, DNS changes. There's it's it's fairly fairly easy to remove if needed. All right. Well, we will have to wrap it up with that. So I want to thank you, Andy. And of course, we want to thank Hornet Security for sponsoring today's focus session. The next and final focus session will be starting very soon. And the link to join that session is included in your email confirmation. And it's also available at that Twitter hashtag MS365Con. This concludes this session. Thank you again for attending. You may now disconnect and we hope to see you again very shortly.